Dr. Arun, we're here in Parsmore's house. People in Harlow will be aware of, of this place, as it, uh, but tell us what is Parsmore's house and what do you do here? So, Parsmore's house is an inpatient detox and rehab centre. Um, we get people off drugs and alcohol, keep them well and then return them to the communities they come from. Actually, this is one of the very few detox and rehab units in the southeast of England now. And the work we do is quite pioneering, quite innovative and actually quite complex. And what's that mean, quite complex? So over the, over the last 10 or 15 years, what we've seen in the addictions field is that uh, the, the, the way people use drugs is different. The types of drugs they're using is different. And this is also on a backdrop of where, you know, people are getting older. So they have all the other medical and uh, psychiatric and social problems that come with a long term history of addictions. So just generally the population we're treating with and the substances they're using are, are more difficult, challenging and complex to treat. So that's what's happening. So are you saying that, say for example, people come here with alcohol addictions, people come here, say, with heroin addiction. But in 2022, is there an uh, increasing expansion of addictions people have addictions to, things that people have addictions oh, to? I think uh, the, what people have addictions to has been expanding for a while in the definition of exp uh, addictions. There's uh, substance addiction and then there's behavioural addictions. So with substance addictions, you have the traditional addictions to substances like heroin, cocaine, ketamine, uh, G drugs. And with the behavioural addictions, you've got internet addiction, gambling addiction. Um, you know, the addictions can be offline and online. But there's a whole host of addictions that are behaviorally related now. At, at its very core, addictions is, is about essentially using a maladaptive coping mechanism to change the way you feel instantly. So that can range from using a substance to change you change the way you feel or a behavior. So say for example, somebody from Harlow, and I know there are not many senses, we'll come to that, they've been to see their GP, they may have gone to Alcoholics Anonymous, they may go to a drop-in center, none of that is working. How hard is it for them to become here? It is quite hard because there aren't, like I said, there aren't a lot of uh, facilities of our type around. But typically what people would do is if none, of, none if that isn't working, is they would go to the GP, the GP would tell them about the community drug and alcohol service in Harlow, which is a very good local uh, drug service. They would go there, they would get seen, they would get supported, their needs would be assessed. And depending on how severe their dependence on alcohol was, they could actually be, you know, uh, supported and counseled in the local treatment services. So they never need to come to a place like this. But if they are actually dependent, then the community drug services can either get them off alcohol with the help of medications in the community. But for the very top end of people who can't get off it in the community, for, for example, because they have a history of faith, so lots of medical problems or, they, or lots of mental health problems or they have cardiac problems, they can't do it safely in the community, they have no social support, then they will make a referral to us and uh, they will come to us. So we currently have a waiting, a, a waiting list of about 200 people um, who are trying to get into Passmore's house. And the average stay for a detox can be between 10 and 14 days. And for a rehab, it's about, um, at the moment, the waiting list for a rehab is about six to nine months, unfortunately. So um, it has to be a very planned out process. We will always prioritize our need though. What's day one like here? Yeah. So day one, they walk through our door, they get seen. I mean, it's a very anxiety provoking time for a lot of patients because they're leaving home. They're in an environment where, you know, uh, they're not familiar with the, having to give up the substance that they've been dependent on that's, the, you know, that's become a part of their lifestyle. So there's lots of ambivalence that people have with their entrenched fears of what the detox process is going to entail. There's a lot of st uh, fear about, you know, actually suffering during a detox. We don't, we actually make it very comfortable for people to come off their substances. They see a doctor and a nurse all your needs are assessed. We check their medical and physical history against the information we've had before they actually came in. We put a plan of uh, treatment in and then they get monitored. Uh, we give them the medications to enable them to safely come off the substance that they're uh, dependent on. And we keep monitoring them through the estate. And how long does treatment take? Or is it like how long is a piece of strain? No, no, no. Most people get funded for a certain number of days. So we have all that in place before they even come in. The funding has to be agreed in principle with the service that's sending them in. So usually for a detox, like I said, about 10 to 14 days. At the very outer limit, we'll probably go to about 28 days for a detox. The rehab can be three months. 
very rarely it gets extended to six months. So a day lapse today, it's a Friday. What treatment is, is going on right now? So you've caught us on a quiet day, but <laughs> usually uh, there's always a program of check-ins in the morning. There's group work, uh, there's detox group work, there's rehab group work. We have counselors coming in. So many, uh, some of the patients will have one-to-one -one counseling on different days of the week. You know, we have uh, gardening, we have uh, uh, the AA and the CA coming in to run groups here. We have someone from the gyms uh, coming and doing fitness sessions with our patients. We have had uh, people teach. Uh, supporting our patients on you know how to cook how to look after themselves so there's a range of activities we try to keep it interesting we have IT skills um, a lot of this has had to stop because of COVID because our patients are quite sick we haven't wanted to have many people from outside come into the service but we're starting to uh, build, uh, build all that back in again so you mentioned COVID so how did COVID impact upon you and do you think COVID had an effect on people, on people in general, on people's life, uh, lifestyles? It's had a tremendous impact on people's lifestyles. Substance misuse services were actually struggling financially even before the pandemic hit. Uh, there's been years and years of cuts. So uh, the services were already on their knees in the community. And when COVID hit, I think it kind of changed the way we had to work. So in the community, I think a, a lot of what's happened is people have been locked away, drinking a lot more unable to maybe access the service, drug services in the same way that they would have done before the pandemic. They've got no other support because you could, they, they were struggling to see GPs or get to hospitals. So the problems, the, the, the substance misuse has gotten worse and the physical health problems that, that come with it and independent of it have also all gotten worse. So now that services are kind of opening up again, all these people are coming back into treatment services and waiting to get to us. So the, the, the cohort we're seeing now is a lot sicker than they were before the pandemic. It was good to see Sajid, the Health Minister Sajid Chavit visit, visit. I'm sure you were pleased to be able to show them what we did. Um, what, do you, what did you get out of that visit or what would you like to get out of that visit? I think the key messages that we would have wanted uh, Sajid to take away, and we're very grateful he actually took the time to, to come and visit us. The government is pumping a lot of money back into substance misuse treatment services. We're very grateful for it. A little bit of money in our sector actually goes a long way. So what hopefully he took away from the visit is just how few detox units there are now in the UK. If you look at the southeast of England, basically, there's no detox unit in the M within the M25. There's Our next detox unit is in Bridge House in Mainstone. And the third one is down in, uh, in Hampshire and then in Birmingham. And then you've got us. So that's a huge part of the country that actually has no provision. And these are very stretch units. We need to be putting the infrastructure in to make detox uh, and rehab available for more people rather than the very sickest. Because people do well with detox and rehab. And the room we're in, I think you used the word that people, a graduation room. So I mean, we want to focus also on success here. You know? So why is this a graduate? What do they graduate from? So, the, um, so every... We have a fantastic success rate in terms of people staying for their detox and their rehab. So very rarely do people walk out of detox or rehab. I mean, a, a rehab, uh, I can't remember the last time somebody actually didn't stay for their full three months. But after their three months, we actually celebrate the journey that they've been on, you know, coming off the substances, learning to live a life without substances, visiting their communities, rebuilding their lives before they actually leave us. So that's what we're celebrating that clear-headedness, the ability to solve problems and to change the way they feel without the use of substances. Can I just make sure I want to go back on, did we, when I say what's on your wish list, what is on your wish list for, for, for your place? For our place, funding, we're trying to open a new uh, detox centre next door. to have big plans, I've seen the plans. We, yep, the lovely plans, it would be a stunning addition architecturally and in terms of health provision to Harlow. I mean, Halu should be proud that there's a unit like this and that there's been a commitment from the council to support us from the get-go. So more of that really innovative treatment in the heart of Halu, some support to funding that unit would be great. Um, and so if the other unit just, I mean, how many, how many people are here at the moment and how many people could you have in the, in the extra unit if you get it? So if, if, we, if we have 23 beds here, if we had the extra unit, it'd be 20 more. We'd be the largest unit um, south of Manchester, really. And finally, it's not just you in front of our camera. As you go into entrance, you meet, meet our teams, a big team, let's all have vital roles. 
Yes, they all do because people who come in here have quite complex problems and it's multifaceted. So you then need a team of specialists around these people. So it is the admin that actually coordinate all this. We have finance specialists, we have HR specialists, we have cooks, we have cleaners, we have deep cleaners, we have the counselors, we have one-to-one -one counselors, we have group workers, we have nursing 24 seven, we've got psychiatrists, we have GPs, so it's a full team of uh, staff that actually uh, look after patients on site. And finally, back to you, as a professional, what do you get out of, of your profession? I think the patients in our sector have so little and they're always very grateful for any help and support that's offered. This is a field that's heavily stigmatized. And it's very, very rewarding to actually take the most challenging patients who've been ignored by society and by their communities and actually help turn their lives around. And, you know, we turn a lot of lives around. The, the amount, number of compliments we get, the number of lives we've saved, the number of uh, people we've have helped kept alive in a sense so they can have their liver transplants. I mean, it's, it's off the charts. It's very, very rewarding work.